copy of a Toronto Daily Mail supplement dated Saturday, April 30th, 1892. It has a feature on Tilbury Centre. Calls it a pretty and progressive village in the county of Essex. And it goes on to talk about its origins and development and the establishment of manufacturing and commercial enterprises. Actually, this is only part of the picture. We found some stories here that would make Stephen Leacock smile like the theater owner who phoned the Hollywood studios direct when she needed films for her movie house. The newspaper publisher who had gold fever. Oh yes, the story about the baseball team, the millionaires. They went broke on one of their road tours. Uh, this is an updated story of Tilbury. Actually, there are three Tilburys and we'll explain that to you later on too. A town that took on the character of the American Midwest, and yet it is set in a landscape that is very much like a little piece of Holland. A blue heron fetches his morning meal. Formerly a bustling refueling and jumping off spot for river boats which ran to and from Detroit, a few kilometers north of the town of Tilbury at the junction of the Thames River and Lake St. Clair. This is Lighthouse Cove. The site was slated to be the entrance for an earlier proposed Tilbury Canal, a man-made water route connecting Lake St. Clair, part of the St. Lawrence Great Lakes Seaway, to Lake Erie to the south. Under Caleb Coatsworth, boosters for the turn of the century scheme pushed the idea on the merits of a dual purpose, to drain the lands of the low-lying peninsula and at the same time shorten the established shipping route, which detours through the Detroit River. Once key to Upper Lake communication, the stronghold of Detroit saw its population scattered after the British conquest. St. Peter's Church along the Thames River was built in 1802, a monument to the recolonization of those refugees. Maxine Gardner. The old uh, French settlement of the area goes back quite a ways. The founding of Fort Detroit and Assumption, which is uh, across the river from that, uh, is a basically the founding of the French settlement. And they just spread out from there all through this part of the country. Growth slowly extended inland, wherever the absence of marshland permitted. But it was 40 years after the first sod was cultivated that political unrest in Upper Canada prompted the government of the day to push through a road. Following a native trail in the interior, the middle road became the backbone of the peninsula, achieving government ambitions, moving troops, and encouraging landholding. It was basically a military road uh, to protect this part of the country during the rebellion of 1837. Once the roads went through, then people could settle along the edges of the roads uh, with their farms. Agriculture, of course, is what brought a lot of people to the area, and lumbering. We used to have our own uh, oil company here, an own gas company. That did bring a lot of Americans here, drillers and uh, uh, 
fellows that run the rigs and the gas lines. Resources, some sustaining, some short-lived, played key roles in various stages of the area's transformation. The outline for the town, with streets of yawning ditches scooped from a sea of mud, began to take shape in the 1870s. The first nucleus of settlement started on the middle road, uh, more or less we call it Tilbury Corners, out here. Actually, the middle road at that particular area was known as St. Francis Street because of the St. Francis Church, the first church, and a small community built around it. The Crossroads Hamlet became today's town of Tilbury, population 4,100. Street names conjure up stories. For example, Queen Street has never been just any main street. Continuously since the start of settlement, oddities surfaced due to its role as a division line, first between surrounding townships, which all shared the same name. At that time, there were two Tilburys, Tilbury East and Tilbury West. Now, since then, in 1891, uh, Tilbury West split into two townships, Tilbury North and Tilbury West. So then it was central to the three Tilburys. This is where people get confused as to which Tilbury people are referring to. And it's uh, because of this amalgamation of uh, townships. Of family names which have contributed to the early formation of the community, Henderson, Richardson, Crawford, one remains a keystone among merchants. A carryover from the days when shopping was a social event, Bruno Badar continues to offer the atmosphere and stories of yesteryear. Well, a lady came in from Comber with her grandchild, and I figured it out to her fitting the sixth generation. And she was, that's for, from being in business about 75 years. Saturday night was the busiest day in the town, you know. The farmers would work till Saturday afternoon, and kind of dress up and come made a visit coming to shop on Saturday nights. Our stores used to be open till midnight uh, because people visited that they'd go, they'd go in and have maybe a drink at the hotel and then walk out at 11 and do their shopping the last half hour. <laughs> Things have changed a little bit. We used to wrap shoes, uh, you know, with a, off a paper roller and I still wrap shoes with paper. The um, liquor control board had their own store uh, in our building. They rented from us, eh? And this one particular uh, old retired fellow had come in and he'd go and buy his bottle of liquor and he'd bring it in to me. He said, wrap it up in a shoebox. I guess he wanted to get it in the house easier, you know? And uh, so I'd wrap it up in a shoebox and he'd go down the street and, and the people would know he had his bottle and he had it in the shoebox. So I guess he'd sneak it into the house that way. But I imagine his wife knew what it was all about because she asked him, how come you're buying so many shoes lately, you know? <laughs> By 1875, publisher and teacher Pringle Shaw was back from rambling the California gold fields. The Canadian Southern Railway's arrival created a feeling of permanence. The newly incorporated village became Tilbury Center. But life at the center was not easy for Queen Street now also divided two counties. Kent County was dry, Essex County was wet, and you could have hotels in a wet district, but you couldn't in a dry district. So the hotels on one side of the street were allowed to operate, where the hotels on the other were not. And yet they had all been in existence for quite some time. So they had to get special dispensation from the legislature to allow these other hotels on the dry side to remain open. I remember a few years ago, Essex and Kent County had different times, Standard Time and Eastern Time. And one part of the town was, they'd say, was uh, standard time. The other one was, uh, was daylight saving time. <laughs> By 1912, a clock tower that displayed the standard time only went up. Part of a new post office and customs building. The landmark continues to occupy its position at Tilbury's Four Corners, a beacon for miles around. As it grew, the Canadian Southern, the Michigan Central, and the CPR contributed to Tilbury's importance as a forwarding center.
Today, midpoint between two mainly agricultural counties, Kent and Essex, Tilbury has become the second largest grain shipping center in southwestern Ontario. Feed corn, for instance, is an important commodity. On the heels of new arrivals in the latter half of the 19th century, forests were cleared and large tracts of land were put into cultivation. Eventually, the wetlands of the region were assessed for their potential. There's an old story about uh, Kent County in Tilbury East where a fella sold his land for the price of a pair of boots so he could walk dry out of the area. Uh, most of the land would be underwater for a good part of the year and you couldn't cultivate it. Turning submerged territory into arable soil became a priority. Over half of the monies raised for township expenses in the early decades were designated for drainage. The Drainage Act allowed for government support in efforts to employ the technology of the day for the huge undertaking. Not the canal system Caleb Coatsworth had dreamed of, the series of ditches were effective. At a parallel with Northern California, the climate and abundance of workable lands today places Tilbury country at the core of Ontario's breadbasket. Around here, it's still Tilbury clay, as they call it. One thing about this area, too, that uh, once Tilbury clay gets into the bloodstream, you're a gone goose. <laughs> You keep coming back to the place. You can't leave it alone. <laughs> A carryover from the days of self-sufficiency, Bob McCracken not only makes his own lumber with his backyard sawmill, he applies the product to an unconventional, scaled-down use. The result, well, I was easily caught up with reminders of my boyhood days on the farm. I always got the job of spreading the hay around the mow. The hay would come up off the rack and then the sling like that, and then it would go along here. And my uncle was a bad guy. Wherever I was standing, that's where he would trip the sling. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> it was the worst job of hay, and it was awful. So, Bob, if this is 90 or 100 years ago, can I get everything on the property here to build this barn? Oh, sure you could. Full size, there was, I mean. Sure. There was lots of material around here. Oh, well, there was a lot of elm used, all hardwoods. It would all be hardwood? Pretty well, yeah, all but yeah. the siding, possibly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at this barn, see how it's set up here. Mm -hmm. Is this a, this is typical? They would possibly have five or six cows, that would be the most. But yeah. they had uh, a very large horse stable because they were working their farms with oh, horses. Oh, yes. The frames for these barns were hewn, the first frames. So they, they would cut. be No, they weren't sawn, the first frames. They were put down on a, uh, on a platform and they would be hacked and hewed. They would mark them with an ax and then take a broad ax and they would uh, make them into square timbers. That's an adze right there. That was used to smooth them off after they hacked and hewed them. This was mm -hmm. the planer of its day? They, yeah, that was the planer of the day. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they planed them in a sense. You can still see the hack and hew marks on them. You mm -hmm. see, uh, you see in the old barns here where they were hacked and hewed and made yeah. into square timbers. This was an art of its own. I want to look at this one. This is built to scale. It was built just exactly the way the timber frame barns were built. I went to the library and I got books, and then I had some knowledge because uh, my father and grandfather mm -hmm. told me how they were framed. What kind of a reaction do you get from the school kids? They, this would be completely foreign to them, wouldn't it? They seem to be very amazed with it. Uh, one of the questions they ask me is, is it a kit? Everything today is built as a kit. And I tell them, no, this, yeah. this is not a kit. And uh, they often want to know how long it took me to make it. And uh, my standard answer for that is I've got $5 worth of material and $5,000 worth of labor in that barn. <laughs> we spent a lot of winter evenings making it. Yes, I'll bet you would. farming to manufacturing. Tilbury's proximity to Detroit resulted in a bonus earlier this century when the Motor City was teeming with excitement. Cranking out Model Ts in endless supply, 
Henry Ford was making automotive history. Tilbury would cash in on the boom through a group of adventurous businessmen whose interests also took in broader playing fields. Tom Odette. My Uncle Ed, A.G. Odette, after he left school at an early age, he saw an opportunity for development of a top factory. Of course, you must remember, in those days, all vehicles were touring. You either had the large touring car, you had the, the, the roadster. So everything needed a top. He could see the opportunity there in the fields for development, and he was an ambitious person and acquired with his brother the controlling interest in the Canadian top company, which he had started here some years before. And then that progressed to a point where in 1920, the name was changed and they went into the manufacture of, of automobile bodies. They produced two fine lines of cars. They had the Hudson and they had the Essex models. And uh, subsequently, they also had what they called the Terraplane. The cars that were manufactured here were well designed and they were an asset to any purchaser of the automobile and they lasted for years. My uncle Ed was interested in sports, and he promoted the baseball team here in Tilbury, uh, called the Tilbury Millionaires. On company payroll, the semi-pro team, while occasionally finding itself batting zero, put Tilbury on the baseball map. Longtime resident Dr. James Richardson, more fondly known as Doc Jim, recalls a few stories. First game they played was against Essex. And Essex came down, and all their fans came down, and they money started being <laughs> put up. And uh, Essex, at that time, they uh, just depended on their local players. When they ran against this bunch of professionals at Tilbury, and the uh, betters in Tilbury, they really cleaned up. Boy, they really, really made a pile of dough. And then uh, about three or four weeks later, Tilbury had a return game with them in, in Essex. All the heavy bettors went down, <laughs> and they started betting on Tilbury. At the end of two innings, I think Tilbury was ahead about one or two nothing. And they uh, stopped the game then, and a couple of fellows came in from a cornfield came ambling in to the ball diamond. And they announced, announced the new battery for Essex as Oakry and Woodall. Well, everybody around here knew who Oakry and Woodall were. They, they used to play for the Detroit Tigers. <laughs> Tilbury didn't score any more runs. I think Essex maybe got four or five runs. They cleaned Tilbury's clock. <laughs> they were on the road there for about three weeks. And uh, they had to send back to town that they were broke. <laughs> they had to take up a collection up and down the main street and to send the money to get them back. The millionaires were part of an era when the spirit of effort and accomplishment was everywhere. If you walk the streets of Tilbury today, you'll be reminded of the driving force of one woman who played many positions at the same time with exceptional ability and flamboyance. Oh yes, Mrs. Loma Hanef, a truly remarkable woman for her day. She was well known uh, in Tilbury as a uh, a lady of self-sufficiency. And if anything was needed to be repaired, Mrs. Feneff was there. She was a carpenter. She could make build buildings. She had several men working under her. She was often seen walking uh, with a straw hat, carrying a hammer, and uh, uh, or you'd see her up on a roof shingling a roof. 
this is long before women were supposed to be doing this, you know. She was an equal opportunity woman long before her time. And she built the Star Theater and had her own theater here. Uh, people would go in to listen to the matinees and she'd have somebody there playing the piano or the organ. And when she wanted films for her company, would uh, call California Direct and could speak to any agent there or Max Sennett or the Warner Brothers or Paramount and get Class A movies anytime she wanted them. All she had to do was call, and they would come on the train for Mrs. Feneff's Star Theater. She used to have a pool cue. And uh, she kept the kids in order with this pool cue. If there was any rumpus or anything in the middle of any of this, this show, she would whistle up to Gib, Gib, who was the operator of the camera. And uh, Gib would turn the lights on and stop the picture, and then she would get up there in the front with this pool cue. And she would lay down the law. No more nonsense. And after she had everybody convinced that she <laughs> meant business, why well, she would whistle again, and Gib would turn the lights off, and on would come the picture again. Memories of those who have gone before and left their mark, big or small. History alive, like a looking glass, spotlighting models, heroes, and heroines, or simply lessons to be learned. It is places like this that foster individuality and independence in its people. And because of its people, it is places like this that possess the quality of being distinctive, a circle unbroken. Tilbury, Ontario, a town, its people, its story. Down that long road, down that long, throughout life we roam. Whenever I go, whenever I go to that place I know, it'll always be home.